Today's episode is proudly sponsored by Dr. Maria O'Rourke and EMCC, that's Emergency Medicine and Critical Care Institute, your beacon of excellence in point-of-care ultrasound education. Hands-on scanning workshops are offered on all topics and for all levels of user experience. Visit emcc-ultrasound.com for detailed information and to secure your spot in an upcoming course in 2024. Emergency Medicine and Critical Care Institute. Educate. Implement. Save lives. This is the Visible Voices Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Risa Lewis. In today's episode, I am so glad to be speaking and in conversation with President Bobby Cordano of Gallaudet University. Let me tell you a little bit about Bobby. She is the first deaf woman, an openly LGBTQ president in Gallaudet University's 159-year history. Gallaudet is the only university in the world where students live and learn bilingually in American Sign Language and English. Bobby is a fierce advocate for language equity and for deaf people being embraced and included in all facets of society. She has many awards and accomplishments. One that I'm going to highlight is in 2023, she was recognized for her leadership and accomplishments. She was named a USA Today Women of the Year honoree. Alongside some people you may recognize, Michelle Obama, Goldie Hawn, Sandra Day O'Connor, and Cheryl Lee Ralph. When we get to the conversation, Bobby and I are speaking about, well, when we first met. So Bobby, you and I met in October of 2022, but you didn't know it yet because I read your piece in Harvard Business Review. Is your organization inclusive of deaf employees? A month later, I reached out to you on LinkedIn and I wrote you a DM and this is what you wrote. Risa, yes. In fact, some of us were having discussions today about how we can do more to work with healthcare, doctors, and medical training programs. I would welcome a meeting. Can you say more about this? Sure. What's real important to remember is that ever since deaf people have been fighting so hard to be able to get what we call early detection of hearing loss and the testing around that to provide intervention services, it was actually deaf people who were fighting for those rights because we knew language deprivation is one of the worst predictors of a person's future. And so with that, we fought hard to get that system in place for early hearing detecting detection. So when you, you know, the first encounter a parent has of, you know, having a child that's deaf is often through that uh, hearing detection system. But what happens is that we've noticed now that doctors, physicians, and the medical systems that are in place take a very medical approach to working with children's and families experiencing hearing loss. And so we've realized that the biggest gain for our children and our families and our overall community and just people who are experiencing any kind of hearing loss at whatever age, what's needed is an engagement of the medical professionals. We need to engage them more deeply and in a broader fashion. Friends with children who are deaf have shared that it wasn't appreciated until late 
meaning once they got into the education system, and to your point, and you've emphasized this, if there's a way to work on systems and structures to assess the need during early development, birth to three months, three years even, then that is better. And children grow into adults with better health. That is absolutely correct. I don't think I can state it any better than you have here. I I will add one thing, though, that's quite fascinating. We have research that shows that the brain does not privilege a spoken language over a signed language. And, you know, in fact, the research also shows that when you provide both languages to all babies between the ages of birth and three, their brains develop much more holistically. In fact, they develop the capacity that will influence their ability to read, their computational skills, and their skills in music are enhanced. So it's interesting that uh, it's also found to be a protective factor against Alzheimer's. So if you learn to sign or a visual language of any sort between the ages of birth and three, those are the advantages. But what we find to be the issue is that once a baby is identified as being deaf, they're given all the tools around developing a spoken language and auditory technologies like hearing aids and cochlear implants. So they're provided all of these devices and technologies, but unfortunately, the medical professionals only privilege spoken language, spoken English here in the United States, and technologies. So what we're trying to do is trying to stop the medical professionals from this binary thinking, imagining that's only one or the other, it's spoken language or signed language, but instead, both is actually a better approach using both as a better approach. You have written about deaf gain, and I'm going to read from your article. It is a radical reframing that views being deaf not as a loss, but an advantage, a different and remarkable way of being. Deaf people bring a positive gain to the workplace through the innovation generated by their lived experiences. And I'll stop and say, I love healthcare design, which is human-centered design, which is bringing people to the table to help create systems, devices, education, workflows, all of it. From creating sign languages to developing texting nearly 60 years ago, to building a multi-billion sign language economy, deaf people have been the engine for countless innovations and significant wealth creation. Go. Well, first off, I just wanted to say how much I appreciate your mentioning this because it's, it's lovely to see you say and share as you have here. What is really beneficial from this conversation that medical professionals and healthcare professionals really need to hear is that what deaf people can offer are tools, tools and strategies to develop more effective communication and human connections in doing so. Human connections, not just through the use of sign language, but they can even use gestures to do the same thing. I mean, think about it. And I can give you a good example here of something. I have two examples, in fact. One is a bit more negative, the other is more positive. But uh, the first one is I ended up in the emergency room one day. I actually had swallowed a fishbone and I was referred to one of the best emergency rooms in the area at that time by a colleague of mine. And uh, I was trying to figure out, I mean, I was just new to the DC area and so I decided to drive myself there. So me, for me, the hassle of dealing with 911 was far too complicated. And I thought driving would be easier. And again, that comes to communication barriers. So I got to the emergency room, right away was taken back, and they had no interpreters available on call for in-person support. And they asked me to use video remote interpreting, VRI, instead. I mean, I was happy to have some kind of tool in the absence of having a system where interpreters would be provided live. So they brought to me a screen, and it's a relatively small screen, I mean, and and thank goodness that I was able to uh, be able to be sitting upright, be able to position myself in front of the camera and see what was on the screen. So I began signing and said, I swallowed a fishbone. 
But the fascinating thing is that somehow the interpretation through the video relay service, and I suspect it's because the screen cut my signing off. You see the way I signed fish. It takes two hands to sign the sign for fish. The sign for blue is the exact same production of the sign, but if you take one hand away, the sign means blue as opposed to fish. So I think the video camera cut off one of the hands so made it look like I said blue, I swallowed blue. Now you can imagine an emergency room doctor, if I was in a critical care moment and all I can tell you is something one time as to what happened, I have one opportunity to share what critical issue I'm experiencing and there's some kind of a communication limitation. I mean, people call to communication technologies as the way and the tools to solve issues, but there are limitations with this technology, especially in emergency situation. So for me, what happened, I ended up having to call one of the interpreters on my team here at Gallaudet to come in person, which she did, to assist with my communication. The emergency room director, of course, witnessed all of this. She was there in the room with a physician with me and was very much surprised at the impact of communication and how ineffective it was through this tool. And it's frightening if you think about it. So systems and individuals' well-being sometimes can clash. Now, let me give you another example of where our ways of being as deaf people are such an additive, is such advantage that I think many professionals in the medical field aren't aware of. And I think they miss the opportunity around gesturing. So a deaf person comes into their practice, they're not able to use spoken language, maybe because they're restrained in some way, they've had a stroke, or perhaps for whatever reason it is, they're unable to communicate in a spoken language clearly. So what happens is, is, you know, we already have, I should tell you, 200 gestures Every human being has 200 gestures innately as part of who they are in their DNA. So there's a workshop we can give here at Gallaudet. And within one hour of being in this workshop, anyone who's there would be able to, when they leave, be able to have a pretty substantial complex conversation solely through the use of gestures. Just through gesturing. If it's a hearing person in this gesturing class, they're able to communicate. So imagine how many times you could gesture and a much more meaningful way to communicate something that words would not be able to. So even just a smiling face, you know, or trying to indicate somebody's unhappy through the way their face is showing that is, is uh, you know, a way to indicate some information. But if you accompany that with a gesture, instead of just using those pictures that try to describe a person's pain from someone's got pointing to a smiling face versus a face that's not smiling. So if, imagine if you could gesture something to show how much pain a person is having by raising your hand or lowering your hand or doing a thumbs up versus thumbs down. You know, to be able to show hurt by learning one sign, you can actually intensify the amount of hurt by modulating the sign, just one single sign. So using facial expressions are also a way to provide more accurate information showing varying degrees of uh, pain a person might be experiencing. So there's so much that we can offer. So it's not just about learning American Sign Language as a language, but it's also about how we can convey, can communicate with one another visually in gestures. And it's so powerful. It is so very powerful. I'm Dr. Risa E. Lewis, dropping in to tell you about a book that Dr. Adair Landry and I wrote. It's called Microskills, Small Actions, Big Impact. It's a business self-help book being published in April of 2024 by HarperCollins. We believe every future goal, complicated task, and healthy habit can be broken down into simple, measurable, and tiny skills that you can practice and then excel by removing obstacles, overcoming assumptions, and maximizing your potential at work and in life. You can pre-order it now. Go to bookshop.org, amazon.com, or wherever you buy your books. The emergency department is so bananas, so out of control, disorganized, chaotic. And what you're sharing is one more way that it can really go wrong. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and sometimes the same thing holds true in the justice system and emergency rooms. They're very similar. They're life and death situations, right? 
Uh, things can be the difference between life and death. And so I'm very aware of how critical it is to make sure that the systems in place are the right ones that should be in place. And you mentioned education as well. That's so true. What happens between the ages of birth and three or what doesn't happen can be a a matter of life and death over a person's lifetime. One of the aspects that impressed me of the work at Gallaudet is research and emphasizing the importance of research. Uh, I read the Center for Deaf Health Equity at Gallaudet. It's a deaf-led research center that conducts research and lays the foundation for health quality among deaf and hard of hearing people. Can you say more, give a specific research outcome that has impressed you? Sure. So first off, I wanted to emphasize something here, and that is as president of Gallaudet University, I want medical schools and technical companies and others to realize that it is critically important to partner with us, to collaborate with us at the UC University when it comes to anything related to deaf, hard of hearing, deaf, blind, or sign language related issues. So often, you know, people want to use the individuals they have who may be deaf or they base their knowledge on someone who may know American Sign Language, but they're not always willing to have the patience necessary to build relationships with us here at the university so that we can make sure that whatever's happening is deaf-led, that the expertise that we hold here, the people who are highly qualified, who are building and developing systems can be a part of that work. People like to go to the shortcuts so they can move forward quickly with things. Mm -hmm. And often that means they don't engage with us. So uh, I would say first off, the Center for Health Equity, Public Health, uh, the focus there, Uh, is around a couple of things. Now, we've been conducting research with the deaf community on the impact of early language deprivation and the lifelong cost that has for individuals. It's astonishing if you think about it. We have data that shows early access to language is a life and death kind of proposition. Mental health, physical health, all can be impacted severely if language exposure is not available. And we've seen through the studies that they're conducting at the center, the impact, the impact of healthcare interactions with uh, caretakers and other individuals. How deaf people can show medical professionals the impact uh, of being deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind. Uh, through the manner of care that's being provided to them. And this is the first time we've really had a nationwide data set that's made information available around healthcare outcomes of deaf people who are part of the system, which is marvelous to that we have the center here that does this kind of research. I'm astonished that it's taken us so long to get to this point that we've been able now to have conversations with healthcare systems. But at the same time, it's taken us so long because you know, we've only just begun producing deaf people with PhDs since the 1950s. So it's been in the 50s and 60s that deaf people first began getting PhDs. So to be able to find deaf people who have the talent and the interest in healthcare, and uh, Dr. Porna Kashaunagar is an individual here at Gallaudet who's just an amazing researcher, one of the best in the world in the area that she works in. And she's here at Gallaudet. And I would love for people to be able to take advantage of her work and to further support the work she's doing. Yeah. This concept of communication, isolation, neglect, studies have shown that this can lead to heart conditions, depression, and other diseases in deaf people. Yeah, very true. Very true. You know, the adverse childhood experience, the ACE scores, the survey that's conducted, um, I know the Kaiser study actually has shown that the higher the person's ACE score is, the more likely they're going to be at high risk of having heart conditions or other conditions. Deaf people and other individuals of marginalized communities actually share a similar experiences of those individuals with higher ACE scores in terms of impact of our lives and lifelong health care outcomes or health outcomes rather. So you just fascinating if you want to see an example of something that I learned when I was working at a statewide level 
uh, on healthcare systems on ACT on Alzheimer's in Minnesota. It was an initiative there in the state of Minnesota. What was surprising to me is that when I first joined this statewide task force focusing on this issue, I looked around the room and almost every single person was white. Most of the individuals were females. There were a few males in the room. And I looked around and thought to myself, where are members of our other communities whom should be represented here? You know, we were not at the healthcare tables as members of the marginalized community. There's not equity in numbers of the people who are represented at those tables. So I took this task on with the relationships that I have and the history that I had in the Minnesota community. And I was able to bring in leaders from a number of different communities and we formed the Health Equity Task Force. It was fascinating. Alzheimer's was identified as a condition by black doctors. Doctors who were doing research and finding information, I think it was someone in Germany at that time, but this doctor in America recognized that this condition existed and they primarily looked at the experiences of many of their patients who were African-American. And that's how they were able to come up with this diagnosis. So it's fascinating that how is it that Alzheimer's has become a, um, a, a treatment approach or rather the system was built around individuals who are white, even though of its origins were based in the African-American community. So I was able together to pull, to pull this task force together and the powerful experience of just listening to one another's stories and hearing their needs. And through that, building a model, model of healthcare equity and then the initiative act on Alzheimer's. The gentleman who brought and funded the work was an individual who's a personal friend of mine. And uh, I was just so proud to be a part of this strong community-led effort and to bring the community into this team and the work we were doing. Everyone so much enjoyed the opportunity of understanding it's not either or, as I mentioned earlier, it's not English or American Sign Language. It's not just white people or black people. It's about our being inclusive of everyone from every community and creating through that a sense of everyone's experiences being understood and creating equity through that. We build better systems when we're able to do that. We build more inclusive systems when we do that. And we give much higher level of care when we do that. And there's no doubt in my mind that that's the case. Here on The Visible Voices, we talk about healthcare, equity, and current trends. So that's a perfect segue into football. In 1894, the football huddle was invented at Gallaudet University. Recently, Gallaudet made gridiron history with the launch of this innovative 5G football helmet in partnership with a partnership with AT&T. Say more, tell the football fans more. Oh, I'd be happy to. Well, first, you have to know that I am a football coach's daughter. My father was one of the winningest record coach coaches, had one of the most winningest record football records in almost 20 years at the schools for the deaf. And so this is just a wonderful story. And there are two things that I wanted to mention here. Yes, you're absolutely right. We invented the football huddle. But I told our football players, you know, you have now created in this 21st century the huddle and brought that to the world. So that's something that has uh, remained current and valuable. There are all the stories about, you know, other players being able to steal the plays of the other teams because they could see them. And that's where the huddle came from. So this, that was a solution that we came up with and then not just for football, but other sports. And then along comes the 5G access. And so being able to have these uh, helmets with 5G access to visible plays is wonderful. And the most exciting part of this is for me that our students coming to a place like Gallaudet allows them to be a part of solving world problems. I mean, can you imagine how many people would say that football players are able to contribute to creating a much needed technology that would benefit the world? Well, our football team does. 
I mean, they're not just out there playing football. They're also learning and designing technologies like the 5G technology alongside of ATT and others to create this new football helmet. So where else do you get that kind of experience as a deaf person? There's no other place but Gallaudet. And if you looked at saw our players and their patience and persistence to make this work, and then afterwards, their sense of pride around it was just incredible. So yeah, we became home of the 5G helmet, I guess, is how we're known now here at Gallaudet, not just the football huddle. But this is a prime example of where the inequity of being deaf in the world, it, it's again, it goes back to the fact that it's inequitable, not because we're deaf, but because of the technology and the way the world is designed. It's not designed for people such as ourselves. So this now has uh, been changed because of technology technology that deaf people need to be able to get visible plays so that we know what's going on. So we create this technology and, you know, under the law, this is now something that will equalize our experience, most certainly when it comes to players on the field playing football, which is all well and good. So what I want to say to everyone who's listening in and watching, while we solved a problem for ourselves as deaf players, we in turn have solved the problem for many others. Think about it. One of the biggest barriers to having visual plays called on the football field if you're deaf and you're signing, um, it, it's a challenge because there's so many fans making noise, right? We want fans to be loud. Fans are always going to be loud and that's great. But what happens when players want to hear the calls? They can't and they can't hear the audibles because the, the uh, fans are so loud. So by creating these visual play calling technologies, all the coaches now can communicate with their players hearing players. And that comes through visual play calling that's now available through these helmets. And this will most likely be adopted by the NCAA, by the NFL, and football will change as a result. Because again, the root of it was addressing the issues with our football players, high school football players, and their needs for access to calls being played visually will now be made available through these helmets. It's changed football in so many amazing ways. But it all comes back to our football players and our students being able to get this incredible experience. Their lives have been transformed absolutely from this experience. And that's what they got from coming to Gallaudet. And the second thing that's so exciting for me, and this comes to uh, another sport, which is swimming. When I became president, we had a terrible situation with one of our swimmers who is deaf and blind. And we addressed the situation by developing a technology with a company that allowed us to have a lighting system to signal the start of the meet. And so that visual lighting system has been adopted by many of the other meets. So it's not just because an individual is deaf, not just because they can't hear the, the sound of the, the start, but with that light, they're actually able to, uh, by a few seconds faster, we know that light travels faster than sound. So that means they actually able to uh, get a well off and be able to begin the swimming faster. So again, it's become a gain for everybody as a result of us having these kind of technologies developed for deaf people. So they're not just advantageous for deaf people, they're very advantageous for many, many other people as well. So Olympic swimmers are now starting faster than they otherwise would because of this technology, all thanks to deaf people. Amazing. Bobby, you are an author, an educator. You worked in the legal system, in the healthcare system. You're a college president. When did you realize you had a voice and when did you start using that voice? Well, I'll be very honest with you here. I was born with a hearing loss and uh, I was born to deaf parents. So I learned to sign language as learned to sign. I mean, deaf sign language was my first language being that my parents were deaf. Um, they didn't know that I was deaf when I was born, but because I had sign language access, I had no challenges around language. I communicated very freely with my parents. And I had enough hearing to be able to pick up some spoken language from my sister, who was hard of hearing at that time. I mean, we're both basically deaf now, but our hearing losses always you know, would qualify us for being deaf, but many people would refer to us as being hard of hearing because we could speak a little bit. But I had enough hearing to be able to hear my sister and other sounds, but I wasn't, you know, challenged linguistically in my ability to express myself. 
So there are stories of me being a young child where um, I can remember my parents actually took me to Gallaudet and I was only four years old when I came to campus and I met my mother's math professor. And at that time, my mother told me for years after this that her math professor right away saw me as a four-year-old and said, oh boy, let me tell you, she is able to have a full-on conversation with me in American Sign Language and that's quite incredible. And I was always so proud as a young person to have my parents say that, that this professor saw me that way. His name was uh, Aaron Bunt, and uh, he was a well-known professor here at Gallaudet for many years. But this whole idea that at four years old, I knew that I could have a conversation with a professor here at Gallaudet University. I mean, what kind of a gift is that to have the gift of language where I could converse so freely that I was intellectually capable from a very young child because of language access to have conversations with a variety of people with barrier-free conversations. And it's important in that way for me to be able to have that voice and to be able to express that voice. Because as a child, you have to feel that you're being heard. And I had a sense of being heard by the deaf community and my ability to communicate with them. My parents would talk with me, would engage with me in conversations and engage others in conversations with us. So that's one thing. The second thing is at the age of 13, I saw the first terrible experience of discrimination against my sister who was deaf and in high school at the time. And I saw the experience that she went through. And this was the first time I felt completely powerless. And I think that's when we feel powerless, when we face the world, that we realize that we need to really shape who we are to be able to make our voices heard. And it becomes clearer in those instances when we're powerless, that we're not getting what we want or what we need. And that's the point in time when I decided that I wanted to become an attorney at the age of 13. I was insistent on that goal and it came to be, but that really strengthened my sense of resolve and then the importance of really creating change in the world because discrimination is wrong and it has to be countered. So those are two things I can speak to. Both are great stories that really shaped me from recognizing my voice, one more positively uh, in such a way that I could communicate so freely, and the other one, the experience of discrimination with my sister. Your legacy. You know, I am a strong believer in the fact that a legacy is not something that would be defined by me. A legacy is defined by the people who will look back on my tenure here and said, this is what Bobby's legacy is. I don't know what my legacy will be. That's hard to predict. But what I can tell you is that I focused very much on the areas that I believe where impact is critical. And that is one in the area of language development and language planning and access. Access to both sign language and to spoken language. And that is something necessary for all of us. I believe everyone should learn sign language from birth. I believe everyone should be learning English or whatever spoken language of their country from birth. But remember, it, it's both. It's, it's a spoken language and a sign language. Often we fight against uh, people who don't recognize the value of deaf people and the value that we have to offer to the world, the contributions that we can make. We're seen just based on our limitations, but not what we add, the advantages that we bring and how we can transform the world just because, you know, we're here, we're part of this world. I want parents and medical professionals and healthcare professionals and educators to really look to that deaf child and see that deaf child and tell them they're going to be beautiful, they're going to be wonderful, and that I, as the other person, will adapt as needed to meet that child's need. So often, we ask and want the child who has differences to adapt and to accommodate us, who we have set ourselves up to be. And you know, the hardest shift that the world has to make, and this is true for parents and members of communities, is to understand that maybe that's not the way it should be. Maybe the adaptation should fall to me, that I should really adapt so that I can work well with others. And, and the last thing I would say is something that I focus on, and that's about the power of collectivism. And that's something that I've learned being a part of the deaf community all my life. 
you know, we lead through collective action. Collectivism is the spirit of collaborating and working together and moving through times together and all the storms we face together. And that's not just true for us in the deaf community, but that's true for all of us in the nation and the world is acting together collectively. Collectivism is the greatest hope we have for peace, the greatest hope we have for acceptance. And civic engagement with one another comes through collectivism. And that's all about building a healthy democracy. So those are the things I'm working on. The scale of the impact of that work and the impact that actually will have is left to be determined by others. I'll just keep trying every single day to make change. The Risa wrap up. Special thanks to President Bobby Cordano and her team, which includes and is not limited to Brandy Reris, L'Oreal Cunningham, Carolyn Ressler, and Karen Durkin. I completely, completely enjoyed this episode. Three take-home points for you, audience. Well, if you haven't read the Harvard Business Review article that Bobby wrote, please read it. As a complimentary article, one of my favorites is the Harvard Business Review article, and you'll see this in the show notes, that talks about diverse teams. Diverse teams are better teams. And for those of you looking at the bottom line, there's a better return on investment. Next, hearing loss, deaf detection. So healthcare systems are doing a little bit better in detecting this in children. What's not quite where it could be is the language acquisition, the development and planning for both English or whatever the language is and ASL, sign language. And finally, human-centered design. The end user, be that the patient, be that the caretaker, be that the clinician. Systems, devices, education programs are better when we design with that human in mind. And thanks to Dr. President Cordano, we have many ways that we can do better. That's all I have for you this week, audience. See you next time. Today's episode is proudly sponsored by em-ccultrasound.com. Dr. Maria O'Rourke and Emergency Medicine and Critical Care Institute are your beacon of excellence in point-of-care ultrasound education. Visit emcc-ultrasound.com for detailed information and to secure your spot in an upcoming course in 2024. Educate, implement, save lives. The Visible Voices podcast amplifies voices both known and unknown, discussing topics of healthcare, equity, and current trends. We are a production of the People's Media Network. Our team includes Dr. Giuliano DePorto and me, Dr. Risa E. Lewis. Please find me on social media at Risa E. Lewis and through the website, thevisiblevoicespodcast.com. If you like the podcast, please rate and review us. Share the podcast with a friend today. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, to be continued.